And I call on the Minister, Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Today's debate takes place in the same week that the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Philip Alston, will visit Scotland as part of a wider visit to the UK to consider the links between poverty and human rights. Like Professor Alston and the UN, the Scottish Government believes poverty is an urgent and pressing human rights concern requiring action from all of us. I hope, therefore, his visit enlightens him to the reality of poverty across the UK for so many people, the concerted work of this government, our local authorities and the third sector to tackle poverty and inequalities, particularly child poverty, and also Scotland's record on standing up for human rights. And I hope he will also realise that despite this, child poverty is set to rise because of the UK government's continued onslaught of welfare cuts. Cuts that in Scotland alone will mean Social Security spending will reduce by an eye-watering £3.7 billion in 2020-21. Like many of you, I hoped last week's UK budget statement would reverse some of the most damaging impacts of UK government welfare cuts. Unfortunately, despite some improvements to the work allowances, the fundamental changes this government, along with many others, have called for have not been made and the UK government's approach to welfare is set to continue to drive more people into poverty. Adam Tompkins. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Will the Cabinet Secretary explain then how the Scottish Government proposes to use its ample powers to top up reserve benefits and to create new benefits, rather than just, rather than just grieving about welfare cuts that other people are introducing? What's the, what does the Scottish Government propose actually to do about it? Minister. Well, what the Scottish Government contends to do is to stand up for the people of Scotland in face of the UK Government cuts and perhaps during Adam Tompkins' um, decisions um, around today he can reflect on what he would like us to cut out of our current budget if he'd like us to use those powers. So we will continue to press the UK Government to ensure that those changes are made. As it was the UK Government that scrapped its own child poverty targets, it's particularly disturbing that these welfare cuts have hit families hard. In particular, larger families and lone parents are badly affected. The two-child limit alone, in just its first year of implementation, reduced the incomes of around 3,800 families in Scotland by up to £2,780. This is a situation which will worsen year on year. The welfare changes introduced by successive UK governments since 2010 is set to increase child poverty in Scotland by around 8%. So whilst we try to lift people out of poverty, the Conservative government is determined to push more families into poverty, making it more challenging to meet the ambitions of this government and this parliament on child poverty. In the face of these welfare changes, and without the full powers over welfare, employment and the living wage, we are fighting poverty with one hand tied behind our back. And all of this is compounded by the systematic failure of the UK government's universal credit programme. When I visited Prospect Housing Association in Wester Hills last week, tenants spoke to me about their fear of the rollout of universal credit. One tenant spoke to me about how he was already in a place where he couldn't afford to heat his home and buy food. So he relied on food banks and they used a candle to light his flat in the evenings. Presiding officer, how has it come to this? COSLA evidence shows that rent arrears for those in receipt of universal credit in full service areas are two and a half times higher than the average arrears for those on housing benefit. Furthermore, new figures out today from the Trussell Trust show a 15% increase in Scottish food bank use in just six months compared to this time last year with benefit delays and the five-week wait being a main reason for this. This is against the backdrop of 52% average increase in food bank use in areas that have had universal credits in place for a year or more. And I know this might be difficult for Adam Tompkins to listen to, but perhaps he'd do well to listen to the Tussle Trust rather than carping from the sidelines Absolutely. during this debate. The fact that universal credit is causing avoidable and unnecessary harm is beyond doubt. And the long list of failings means the situation is set to get bleaker. The minimum inbuilt five-week wait for a first payment causes people much of this harm. The National Audit Office found that a fifth of all clients are not paid their full universal credit entitlement on time, with around 13% not receiving any payment at all. And the DWP does not expect this to improve significantly. 
If universal credit is supposed to mirror the world of work, then at least it should be paid on time and in full. Now, the minimum income floor for self-employed people, which makes unreasonable assumptions about the amount of money someone must earn while on universal credit, is a clear disincentive for people who might consider self-employment. And as I've mentioned, the two-child cap policy and the rate clause are completely unacceptable, deeply harmful and a fundamental violation of human rights, despite what members of the Conservative benches might think. In June, it was revealed by the DWP that 190 women across the UK had to fill in an eight-page form to prove that their child was conceived as a result of rape in order to receive the financial support to which their child is entitled. That is a disgrace. The two-child two limit must be scrapped with immediate effect and the abhorrent rape clause with it. In addition, evidence shows that the UK government's punitive approach to benefit sanctions and conditionality is not only ineffective, but it's having a damaging effect on the health and well-being of people, as well as pushing them into poverty. During another recent visit, I was told about the case of a man who had phoned his local Citizens Advice Bureau to arrange to get a food parcel. The man had been sanctioned after missing an appointment at his job centre, which is several miles away in a different town to where he lives, and he couldn't afford the fares to go there. The client had mental health issues, and the CAB were aware he had gone without eating for days at a time as he had to receive food parcels in the past. He also wanted to know if he could be able to get some toilet paper and some cleaning products at the food bank. The CAB marked his case as starvation while waiting for universal credit. It is simply beyond comprehension that our welfare system, which is supposed to be a safety net, has become so punitive that it is driving people to destitution. A Work and Pensions Committee report published today recommends the DWP should work with experts to develop a programme of voluntary employment support for disabled people, exactly the approach we are now taking in Scotland in our main devolved employability programme. And today's committee report highlights once again the failings in the whole conditionality and sanctions regime. That's why it needs to be urgently reviewed. Next year, we'll see the managed migration phase of universal credit begin to roll out. It will require people claiming working tax credits to make a new claim to universal credit or risk losing their benefit entitlements. In addition, by the UK government's own estimate, one third of those due to switch to universal credit during managed migration will be people with disabilities or long-term health conditions. Given what we already know about the state of universal credit so far, this is extremely concerning. And before members on the Conservative benches rise to defend the changes made in the budget, let me ask them if they really know what they mean in practice. Many of the changes announced will come into force for years. The repayment period for advances will increase by six months, but not until October 2021, three years away. The two-week run on and legacy benefits will not be in place until July 2020, 21 months away. Universal credit needs fixed now, not having the smallest of sticking plasters applied over the next couple of years. Increases to work allowances for people with children and people with disabilities are welcome, as far as it goes, because it only undoes half of the 2015 cuts. And devastatingly for many households, the benefit freeze still remains in place. This has led to a reduction in spending for around £190 million in this financial year. Increases in the cost of living with no increase in the level of benefits people rely on is unfair and illogical. So much for the end of austerity. Now, the Scottish Government is using its limited powers we have to try and make the delivery of universal credit better suited to those who need to claim it. Since last October, our universal credit Scottish Choices means people have had the choice to receive their universal credit award twice monthly and have the housing costs in their award paid directly to their landlord in both the private and social rented sector. The take-up has been high, with around 32,000 people, almost 50%, taking up one or both of those choices. This provides us with good evidence that people do want more flexibility and adaptability in how they receive the support they are entitled to, adding weight to the argument that further changes to the DWP benefit system are needed. Scotland is also committed to introducing split payments 
to provide an independent income to all universal credit claimants and to promote equality in the social security system. We continue to engage with a wide range of stakeholders and people in receipt of universal credit to help us develop the policy on how payments should be split and we'll make an announcement on this in due course. But, presiding officer, I know that there will be calls from some, and we've heard it already today, that the Scottish Government should do more to mitigate the cuts coming from, we from Westminster. Well, this year we're spending £125 million on welfare mitigation alone. However, I would say this. We cannot get ourselves into a position and into a place where the UK Government continues to slash and burn its way through our welfare state and the Scottish Government is expected to take money from other budgets to somehow paper over the cracks of that crumbling system. This Parliament, which most of us campaigned long and hard for, is here for so much more than just picking up the pieces from failed Tory austerity policies in Westminster. And therefore, once again, I would urge the UK Government to listen to the evidence, to make the changes necessary to universal credit and reverse the cuts that they are inflicting and help us raise people out of poverty. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I call Michelle Ballantyne to speak to move amendment 14621.1. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. There's been a great deal said about universal credit since last Monday's budget. And while much of this commentary has been balanced and constructive, others have been less so. And, I dare, and dare I say it, have made points that are more politically motivated than related to the situation on the ground. Much of the rhetoric, once again, has inferred that the legacy systems that universal credit replaces were working well and were addressing the issues of poverty. This is simply not the case. Experts at the Institute for Fiscal Studies pointed out that with tax credits, working over 16 hours a week made little sense because the gain from earnings was negligible as benefits were withdrawn. It was a system driven by the wrong incentives. By 2011, the UK was one of the worst performing countries in Europe for workless households, ranking 28th out of 28. As a system, it was far too complex and error prone. For claimants, there were layers upon layers of interacting benefits, all with their own rules and procedures. In, in 2009 to 10, error, not at the moment, I need to make some progress. Error and fraud were estimated to cost the taxpayer around £5.2 billion a year, while in the same year, underpayments left customers without entitlements estimated at £1.3 billion a year in benefits and £260 million a year in tax credits. That was the legacy of Labour and the old systems, and that was the legacy inherited by the coalition government in the midst of the most damaging financial crisis of recent times. A simplification of the system was drastically needed, but sadly, previous governments failed to take decisive action, yeah. choosing only to tinker around the edges. Yeah. Universal credit is the bold reform we need, a system that reflects working life as it is and allows for changes to circumstances flexing with the needs of the individual. Work is the fundamental route out of poverty. Yeah. The Institute of Fiscal Studies have highlighted that this week, and universal credit is the right vehicle. We are seeing this in the statistics. Youth unemployment has fallen more, by more than 50% since 2010. We have record employment rate of 75.7%. And since 2010, our policies have seen an average of 1,000 people moving into work each and every day. The United Kingdom and Universal Credit are working. Yes, I will. Minister, shall I answer that? I'm grateful to the member for taking an intervention on that point of a thousand more people in work over a decade is it also actually true that there's been a three million um, um, people increase in the population and therefore actually the more people into work have actually got nothing to do with benefit system but actually everything to do with a population increase and isn't also important to actually talk about the quality of work rather than universal credit forcing people onto exploitative zero hours contracts michelle Ballantyne. There are more people working than ever before. There are more jobs in the economy ever before. And actually, this, this Conservative government actually legislated against exploitive zero contract. So you cannot keep using that as a reference. Furthermore, I'm, I've just taken one. I'm going to continue. 
Furthermore, the policy's fundamental principles to simplify welfare, to make work pay, and to ensure that those who need support receive it are sound. And I hope few in this chamber would disagree with those aims. Of course, universal credit has its problems. And attempting to untangle the web of legacy benefits and tax credits, split as they are between the Treasury and the DWP, is a challenge. However, one of Universal Credit's strengths is its test and learn approach. Previously, when something went wrong with the old system, there was no flexibility to change it. Now, new changes are tested, problems can be identified, and solutions found. The Social Security Advisory Committee at Westminster have praised this approach, welcoming the stated intention to test and learn. On numerous occasions, it has lent UC a flexibility that is light years ahead of any process offered by the legacy benefit system. It was, however, clear that Universal Credit did require extra funding. I'd raised this myself with Estimate Vey and other of her colleagues, and I know it was an opinion shared by many colleagues on this side of the benches as well as that side. And that is why the Chancellor's announcement last Monday is welcome as it provides Universal Credit with a boost prior to the rollout of managed migration. While I know the Scottish Government want to talk about cuts to the welfare budget, I believe they will find that Universal Credit is more generous than the system it replaces. An analysis from both the Resolution Foundation and IFS confirm this, with a boost for families on UC worth around £630 a year. With £1.7 billion earmarked to increase the work allowance, the UK government is not just making sure that work pays, but that it pays more, helping some 2.4 million families work their way out of poverty. Mr Hammond also included a further billion pounds to assist with managed migration. And yesterday we heard from the Secretary of State just how that money will be spent. The debt that people are carrying when they come onto UC is a real concern. And I'm delighted that repayments rates will be reduced from 40 to 30% of standard income, helping over 600,000 families, a move that was backed by Frank Field MP. Equally, the repayment per period for advances will be extended from 12 to 16 months, giving people extra breathing space to get on top of their finances. And for the self-employed, there will be a 12-month grace period before the minimum income floor comes into effect, providing 130,000 families the best opportunity to grow a successful business. Managed migration will now happen over a longer period in smaller batches to ensure a smooth transition. And there will be added protection for 500,000 people cl claiming severe disability premium and existing decisions or verification will now be used to make aspects of the process easier. I know the waiting period has been of concern to many in this chamber, so perhaps for me and others, most welcome of all is the announcement that the DWP will begin a two-week run-on for those receiving out-of-work benefits. In practical terms, this means that when an individual moves on to universal credit, they will receive an additional two weeks payment, reducing the waiting time for their first universal credit payment and helping vulnerable claimants make a smooth transition to the new system. All of this is a clear sign that whilst universal credit is already working for the majority of claimants, yeah. where there are issues, the UK government is working to resolve them. Yeah. No one is suggesting that this change is easy or faultless, but once these reforms are complete, the system will be much less unwieldy and will have a social, social security system that reflects modern life, a system genuinely designed to help people move out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Mark Griffin to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. The timing of this debate is very welcome, following the budget and Esther McVeigh's statement. But it does seem that the UK government thinks the debate about universal credit can be put to bed for this year. But as we welcome the UN Special Rapporteur, I hope today we can make clear more must be done, and both MPs and MSPs must act to help people suffering. And though much of what I um, plan on saying today will focus on universal credit, I wanted to thank the organisations in the third sector for their briefings covering all aspects of welfare reform. The MS Society again make their urgent call to end the PIP 20 metre rule and Inclusion Scotland make a broader point about how disabled people have been targeted by reforms. 
SCVO and the Scottish Human Rights Consortium remind us to take a broader consideration about poverty and human rights too. But, President officer, we will support the Government's motion, but we want to amend it, urging MPs to vote down the managed migration regulations and for Holyrood to look at how it can go further. Now, we often hear from the Government um, the claim that we can't mitigate all of Westminster's cuts and wouldn't it be better if all welfare were devolved, but neither of those help the 120,000 people who have suffered rollout to date or the 90,000 people who went to food banks since April. Our amendment calls for cross-party talks about what we can do right now. And when you look at last week's budget and yesterday's announcement, it's clear that the UK government has not gone far enough. Philip, ha Philip Hammond's £1,000 boost to work allowances, an estimate-based failure to tackle brutal systemic flaws, are a set of fudges that do not fix universal credit. In my central Scotland region, 21,000 people have moved on to universal credit over the past year. They are suffering rent arrears, which have quadrupled, are having to be pay back almost £8 million in advances at a rate of 40%, and a brutal conditionality system forcing workers to find more work. They need support now, not constitutional rhetoric or for the DWP to take years more time. And yes, the £1,000 partial uplift in the work allowance is on its own a welcome improvement, but it will help some more than others. The Resolution Foundation points out that, um, how that lone parents and disabled people who are toiling to pay a mortgage or won't get help paying the rent, will still be worse off by £2,200. Mirroring UK Labour's 10-point action plan on universal credit, the Poverty Alliance make the call for lifting the £370 million benefit freeze, ending the two-child cap, ending sanctions and conditionality and weeks of waiting. All are still urgently needed to cut through the misery of universal credit. And yesterday's announcement that help for self-employed and a newer 30% collection rate um, that will be imp implemented uh, is welcome. And while the two-week run-on payment shortened the initial wait to three weeks, those on child tax credits, again, lone parents and the working poor are penalised because those run-on payments won't apply to them. And aside from the announcements in themselves, the delay in implementing those um, changes still don't help any of the people who have moved on to universal credit already. Presiding officer, MPs must halt the Tories' managed migration because, bluntly, there's nothing managed about it. Mm. There will now be more time to claim or backdate, but inherent to the design of the process is an attempt to catch people out. People on tax credits will get a time-limited invitation to apply. If they don't, they risk losing their transitional protection. But surely it has to be better than that. Here in Scotland, we should have serious, thorough discussion about how we can make people's lives easier. Call it mitigation, if you will, but people have to be reassured that Holyrood does act and is better than this callous Tory government. A child benefit top-up is a, a starting point, the Give Me Five Coalition Advocate. Though we know the SNP refuse to support that. We could look at fast-tracking this income supplement for lone parents and the disabled those still losing out because of George Osborne's work allowance cuts is another possibility. Last week's figures on the Scottish Welfare Fund, Scottish Choices, show they're being well used by families across the country. So we should heed the call of the Social Security Committee and increase its funding. Not just an uprating, but a substantial increase, which not only reverses the real terms cuts since 2014, but makes sure that people in crisis can get the support they need that half of people have taken up a universal credit flexibility when asked is good progress. But with, with arrears still growing, the government should look at improving this further. Just as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned split payments, should landlord payments not be automatic with an opt-out? And on the two-child two cap, I wasn't here for the debate when Michelle Ballantyne set out her reasons for supporting that, but I did watch it back and I reflected on my own family's circumstances. I was one of four. My mother and father worked hard as a welder and a banking clerk to support the family they chose to have. 
Um, at 37, my dad was diagnosed with um, serious, a serious heart condition. It meant he wasn't able to carry out the work that he was trained and, and did for 20 years. Who plans for these situations? Who in Dundee plans for the situation that they've woken up to this morning? When they planned to have a family bigger than two. Where is the support network? Where is the state support that children depend on day in, day out, when circumstances change beyond anyone's uh, comprehension? <laughs> and I hope in the, the talks that flow out of today, um, we must look at the, the new powers to either eradicate welfare reforms or depart from the UK government's direction. Just as we've banned the private sector from assessments and secure dignity and respect for the terminally ill, we should uh, look at ending the 20 metre rule and, and put in place the certainty of automatic entitlement. We should be looking to lift the earnings limit and allow full-time carers to access full-time education, providing real freedom to work and study. Presiding officer, today we can condemn the Tory government as we have many times before. But I hope that MPs of all parties act when it comes to managed migration, and so should we. And so I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Griffin. And I call on Alison Johnson to move the motion on behalf of the Green Party. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Um, Mark Griffin spoke of some of the organisations who have briefed us for this debate, and I think it's notable the level of briefings that we've received, and I think that demonstrates how much interest and concern there is around universal credit. In passing the Child Poverty Scotland Act last year, this Parliament took a really important step. This Parliament said that it's unacceptable to have hundreds of thousands of Scots children growing up without access to the basics of life, a good diet, a warm, safe home, toys and activities that allow them to grow and develop. And as the motion notes, we've already made some progress towards reducing poverty in setting up the new Scottish social security system. The new Best Start grant, launching very shortly, will more than double the amount of income available to low-income families. And the changes to the devolved disability benefit assessment process made by the Greens, supported by this Parliament, are intended to ensure people get the support they need in as non-intrusive and dignified a way as possible. So there is positive change, but the cuts, and let's call them that, not reforms, not changes, cuts, risk undermining this ambition and the progress that we're making. In March, Landman Economics projected that relative child poverty will soar to 38% by the late 2020s. The forecast increase, and I am quoting, is driven by the substantial cuts to social security for families with children legislated for in the previous UK government's July 2015 budget. In particular, the four-year freeze on social security uprating and the two-child limit for housing benefit, tax credit and universal credit claims. So let's be clear. Cuts to our social security system, including to universal credit, are taking money out of the pockets and wallets of some of the poorest households in Scotland. Yes, last week's budget reversed some of the 2015 work allowance cuts, which should never have been made in the first place. This is welcome. But these do not apply to all universal credit recipients. For those without children or without disabled people in the household, those cuts remain. And this only represents about 1.7 billion of the three billion pound work allowance cuts made by the 2015 budget. As Paul Johnson of the Institute for Fiscal Studies notes, universal credit is quite deliberately creating millions of winners and millions of losers. A third will be 1,000 pounds a year off a year worse off under universal credit, and that is not taking into account other cuts. We still have the benefit cap, we still have the two-child limit, and we still have the benefit freeze. Taking those into account, some families will be losing many thousands a year. The IFS projects that over the long term, the poorest 10% of households with children will lose £3,000 annually as a result of tax and benefit changes. In the worst case, for a family unfortunate enough not to have parents in work, the long run impact of tax and benefit changes is a loss of over £4,000. I'd now like to turn to the gendered nature of the cuts mentioned in the Green Party amendment this afternoon. 
Cutting Social Security reduces the incomes of women disproportionately. Over the decade of austerity, from 2010 to 20, 86% of net so-called savings raised through cuts to Social Security will come from women's income, placing women at a greater risk of deeper and sustained poverty. The IFS figures show that by 2020, lone parent families, overwhelmingly female, lose more than £3,000 a year. To take just one example, the benefit cap, in effect, targets women and their children for cuts. The latest figures for August this year show that almost 90% of the single claimants impacted by the benefit cap in Scotland are women, and 91% of households caps have at least one child. Policy and practices research shows that for every claimant who managed to move off the cap, there's more than one household which is stuck on the cap for six months or longer. For six months, that's a cut of £360. The average shortfall between rent and housing support for those trapped by the cap is £3,750 a year. The research shows, and I quote, the majority of capped households showed no change in their circumstances other than a significant worsening of their living standards following the introduction of the benefit cap. It's unlikely that the benefits of this policy, both in terms of the savings generated and the positive impacts on employment outcomes, have offset the financial costs, or crucially, the human and social costs associated with rising levels of economic destitution. And the design of universal credit, paying out to only one person in a household, is deeply problematic. Close the Gap argues that the single household payment of universal credit has left many women with no independent access to an income. The Women's Budget Group is concerned that the reduction of women's financial autonomy could result in main carers, in practice, usually mothers, losing clearly labelled child, pay child payments, which currently are often paid separately and can provide a lifeline to survivors of domestic abuse. Presiding officer, poverty is a tragedy. It's a tragedy because it means that hundreds of thousands of Scots, including over 200,000 children, are growing up without access to the resources, opportunities and life chances that everyone else takes for granted. I accept that some, amend, some improvements have and are being made to universal credit, and these are welcome. But some families are still going to be very much worse off as a result of benefit cuts. I agree with Mark Griffin. This Parliament has a strong role to play, and I look forward to addressing that further in closing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call um, Alec Cole-Hamilton to speak to and move Amendment 14621.4. Tight six minutes, Mr Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. I'm very grateful to the Government for bringing the, this motion to Parliament, as I am also for Labour's amendment and the Green Amendment, both of which we are happy to support. Um, as a Liberal, I often lean into the words of William Beveridge uh, whenever we talk about welfare and the social state, but it's a recognition that we have still failed to meet the challenge of beverage in addressing those five giant evils of ignorance, idleness, squalor, want and disease. In over 60 years since he wrote those words that I think my party first embarked upon the project of welfare reform because it might be surprising that my party would be so full-throated in its backing of the government motion today were it not for the fact that yes it was true that we were there at the genesis of this project. We embarked uh, in good faith on this project towards universal credit and yes I admit would we had had different partners it might have been different but looking over our shoulder now and gazing at what has become of that project we do so in no small degree of abject horror we see in the evisceration of the work allowance in the stubborn incompetence and inability to address those real practical problems associated with its rollout and yes in the two child limit um, and the rape clause that necessarily stems from it which we blocked continually in our time in, pro in office. We did so because we believe that the provision of a safety net should never be uh, have never such a precondition attached to it. I think I associate myself with Mark Griffin's remarks and very powerful personal testimony where we don't believe for a second that normal family life should be denied to you should you happen on hard times. And that is why we resisted the child cap uh, through our time in office. For us, at first principles, this is about the provision of a national minimum by the state. And that should be, in turn, a catalyst for social mobility, a safety net where needed, but a catalyst for social mobility to allow people to hold themselves out of that national mi uh, mo um, 
that, that position. And welfare reform is a necessary undertaking to that end. And many poverty campaigners agreed with that underlying principle. And uh, th I think our support for that motion still does not abandon that, that principle that uh, some degree of welfare reform was needed. But I think that the, the motion is right because it speaks to the values that we share, that we should listen to the casualties that have suffered as a result of the botched rollout so far, heed their warnings and recognise the tremendous capacity this has to harm some of the most vulnerable constituents that we all represent. In the first days of the ro rollout, those warning lights started to wink to life across the, the, uh, the dashboard of their delivery. And in the last debate last month on this topic, I quoted Frank Field, who rightly, in his capacity of chair of the Work and Pension Select Committee, said that Wonderland visions of welfare reform collapse on contact with real life. And that's not down uh, around the original tensions of reform. It's about the fact that the centre of gravity has inexorably shifted away from that original vision, and that's evidenced uh, in the cut to which my amendment speaks. And we were clear throughout our participation that first priority should be, first of all, to protect and assure a national minimum family uh, income. That should be the alpha and the omega. Thereafter, a simplification and streamlining of the process would lead to some uh, savings in terms of bureaucracy. Uh, but uh, above all things as well, it would incentivize incentivize work. However, the Conservatives, governing unencumbered from our influence, have demonstrated that the money-saving aspect of welfare reform is the supremacy of all other considerations. And we see that in the £3 billion slashed from the work allowance, which undermines both family income and indeed roots into work. So that theoretical starting point, presiding officer, has been corrupted by a, an ideological shift away from the original intent. And to add insult to injury, that practical rollout has been, set, been beset by a catalogue of errors to demonstrable human costs in the rent arrears that we see mounting for those who are already in direct receipt of the housing benefit component, in unintended penalties that we've heard something about in terms of self-employees. And again, I associate myself with the remarks of Alison Johnson, who's right to point out the iniquity of not, being a, not having a system fleet of foot enough to recognise that families aren't always united, that we, by necessity, sometimes have to divide payments between claimants, particularly in abusive spouses relationships where finance is still used as a tool of coercive control. Above all, this affords no comfort. The, the plans afford no comfort to families in Edinburgh and beyond who this Christmas will face the rollout in the understanding of the problems that have befallen those who've gone before them. And those delays are legion and will happen at a festive, over the festive period when household incomes and budgets are already stretched to capacity. Now, I have taken, rightly, criticism in this chamber uh, in debates like these about my party's role um, in the past in respect of welfare offers reform and in coalition but also in these debates like these I point to what the Conservatives are now doing unencumbered by our influence in the uncertainty and reduction around the benefits available to people in the erosion of social mobility and in the two-child limit which has by extension created the rape clause for my party this was a project of reform which started with the best of intentions and has now been hopelessly derailed and corrupted by an ideal right-wing ideological right-wing intent and it needs to be stopped. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open debate, speeches of six minutes, please. George Adam to follow by Annie Wells. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I joined the SNP in my late teens, 18 years old, and at the time my community was under siege from an uncaring Conservative government in Westminster. The years move on, but some things never seem to change. But what happened then probably defined me politically. And it was at that point that I knew the type of future I wanted for Scotland. I've changed, I've got older, mellowed slightly, but the Tories don't seem to have changed. Because even here today, we heard Michelle Ballantyne say universal credit is a system that tests and learns. Tests and learns, honestly. How can anyone say that? Say that to the families in my constituency who are suffering because of universal credit. Test and learn. It's more like test and ignore. What we are discussing today is one of the foremost issues that our people in the country are facing. Although not everyone is directly affected by the introduction and implementation of universal credit, the threads run through our society. We were told that the merging of these benefits would streamline the system, make it simpler, 
easier to access and easy that the transformation to work would be simpler. I don't think I've ever came across a government programme that not only does not meet any of its objectives, it targets those most in need of its services. A social security system is something that a modern, forward-looking nation should be proud of. A helping hand for those in the time of need, whether losing their job or changes in their circumstances that are beyond their control. And Mark Griffin gave a perfect example of those in Dundee today who may have had a major change in their circumstances in the near future. None of it was their fault, but their life might be changing dramatically. And every one of us can face these changes at some stage in our life. All of us in this chamber must have been contacted by those facing these hardships. The flaws found throughout this system are incredible. But these issues have been highlighted to us by the National Audit Office, Citizens of Ice Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, Child Poverty Scotland and many others. These issues, and with the migration of benefits, the loss of income, the issues with passported benefits, the reliance of online claims, the predicted increase in poverty and child poverty, universal credit has fundamental flaws. There are many, but one of the most incredible is the length of time it takes to get an initial payment. This pushes families into debt and rent arrears. Many of these people have never been in arrears in their entire life, having worked, paid their bills and made sure that their home was secure. This is the first time that these people are facing the prospect of being behind in their rent due to the de uh, delays inherent in this system. 73% of those in universal credit are in rent arrears. This compares to 29% of those not on universal credit. It is easy to see what is happening in our communities with the introduction of universal credit. There is an average of 52% increased usage of food banks in areas where universal credit has been in place for more than one year. This is not insignificant, yet we hear from the Conservatives that there are many reasons for the increased use of food banks. Presiding officer, I would say that the issue is poverty. Poverty that is brought out by a failed and flawed welfare reform programme. Can you imagine having to go to a collection office, ask for a referral, exposing yourself to feelings that no one would normally wish to experience, presenting yourself in order to ask for food to feed yourself and your family? But I would like to know what these other reasons that the uh, increases for food bank use that the Tories are so, so keen on. I do, not I do find it hard sometimes to understand the mindset of those determined to make another person's life more difficult, especially those in society that actually need our help. We also, as parliamentarians, have experienced those with long-term health conditions uh, have been affected by these welfare changes. We've seen the targeting of people with disabilities and the introduction of PIP with the introduction of universal credit and those who previously claimed uh, employment support allowance. Presiding officer, the life chances that you and I have been given are often harder for others to obtain or even uh, think of obtaining. Being able to lead a life with the quality of freedom and access was something that the DLA and ESA was to provide. I'm not the only one who has witnessed the changes over recent years which changes many people's lives with removal or reduction of DLA. The stories have been uh, of those unable to work being pressured to take employment. One of my constituents had served in the army. He got a medal for his term in Afghanistan. He was assessed for work on the Tuesday. He was informed by the assessor that he was being treated, he informed the assessor he was being treated for cancer and was having an operation two days later. This young man was immediately passed fit for work. The sanctions associated with this system are another way that target those in need. Those hard situations, little money and finding it hard to get by, what do we do with them? They get sanctioned. Most of the chamber will know the story of my constituent that had a heart attack and couldn't sign on. He told the job centre and was sanctioned nonetheless. So even if you have a heart attack and you're in the hospital, you still be sanctioned under this uncare, uncaring Tory government. That is what the Tory welfare reform is all about. Where is the dignity? Where is the respect? Where is the understanding that life's events happen? The Scottish Government should not be paying for Westminster's mistakes. Our Scottish Government will continue to make the right decisions. To have a truly fair society, a social security system with dignity and respect should be at the centre of that. Presiding officer, I may have changed over the past year since I joined the SNP. Things may have moved on. But one thing you can guarantee, you can never trust a Tory. Thank you, Mr Adam. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Bob Doris. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
It goes without saying that we've seen renewed discussion around the impact of universal credit and its effectiveness in recent weeks and months. And I welcome this discussion. We all agree that the rollout should be done as sensitively as possible, considering first and foremost those who the system set out to support. As the Chancellor said last week, universal credit is here to stay, and it is our duty to make sure it becomes a success it was designed to be. A couple of weeks ago, I put on record my own concerns regarding universal credit, calling on the UK government to implement universal credit in a way that saw no one left behind. I called for measures to be put in place to reform the system before its full rollout and asked that the most vulnerable in our society be reassured that their concerns would be listened to. And it's clear in the Chamber today that concerns will continue to be raised, but it is important that we recognise the fundamental support universal credit has in principle and that the UK Government will and has listened and responded to concerns as it's rolled out. I've seen the effects of being trapped in the benefit system with little opportunity of entering the workforce. And when Ian Duncan Smith MP visited Easter House in 2002, he recognised that the policies in place at the time simply did not work. He saw the need to give people an alternative to a life in benefits, one that provides a safety net when needed most, and one that ensured work would always pay. And that is the point, work is essential to tackling poverty. People out of work are much more likely to fall into the poverty when living in a workless household. We must support simplifying a welfare system that ensures it always pays to work. It makes no sense that under Labour, the benefit system was so complicated that for some people, there was little point working. As, more, as they worked more, they lost more in benefits as they would earn in work. Third sector organisations have supported the principle of universal credit. And just this week, the Institute of Fiscal Studies said, and I quote, that universal credit had large potential benefits from simplification and getting rid of weak work incentives. Last month, the, Resolu the Resolution Foundation said that the prize of the far simpler social security system was one well worth holding on to. The implementation of universal credit is, of course, as important as its guiding principles. The UK government has listened to concerns and changes have rightfully, rightfully been made over time. In 2017, the UK government recognised the practical difficulties in implementing the system and made a number of changes, totalling a £1.5 billion investment. An interest-free advance of up to one month's worth of universal credit was made available from January of this year. The seven-day waiting period was removed from February. And from April 2018, those already on housing benefit could receive the reward for the first two weeks of, the, of their universal credit claim. And two weeks ago, changes were made during the 2018 budget where were welcomed as, a, as according to the IFS and Resolution Foundation, they made universal credit more generous, generous than the system it replaced. The Chancellor announced that as of April 2019, universal credit claimants would benefit from a £1,000 increase in in-work in allowances, meaning that working parents and people with disabilities on universal credit will be £630 a year better off. Claimants, I've actually got quite a lot to, to go through, so I apologise. Claimants will be able to repay overpayments and debt more slowly from October next year. And from October 2021, people will no longer have to repay advances. And in listening to and responding to concerns over the rollout, the UK government has extended the managed migration schedule to conclude in 2023. And only yesterday, Working Pension Secretary Esther McVeigh announced new changes, including extending the deadline for claimants to move on to universal credit from, a, from one month to three. What is clear is that universal as universal credit is rolled out, the UK government has and will continue to listen to concerns. And let's not forget in today's debate that the Scottish government does in fact have significant powers when it comes to welfare policy. The Scotland Act 2016 devolve powers to the Scottish Parliament to introduce new benefits and top up any reserved benefit it saw fit to. If the Scottish Government is serious about develop developing a fair and affordable welfare system, this is the time to prove it. As has been said, the Scottish Government is of course facing its own hurdles when it comes to Social Security. 
I'm in my last minute, thank you very much. The SNP government have talked up their new social security bases, but now we learn that they have no idea where the staff are going to be working across Scotland. And they have been stalling for so long in a timeline for their, their plans for the new benefits that the independent Office of Budget Responsibility the have been unable closing. to work out how much it will actually cost. To finish today, I would like again to stress that the UK government's principles behind their welfare reforms are the right ones. The extra support in the budget is very welcome and I hope it can alleviate many of the concerns raised so far, including the ones that I raised. However, I hope this debate can also be a real opportunity as we see progress today to hear about genuine proposals from the SNP government as to how they will deliver welfare reform now that they have the significant powers to do so. That would be a positive move in the right direction on welfare. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Doris, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, this debate on universal credit is vitally important, although the matters we must discuss this afternoon are deeply unwelcome. Universal credit sits at the heart of a UK welfare reform agenda, in reality a cuts agenda, which will remove around £3.7 billion from social security spending in Scotland by 2021. This is not simply numbers on a budget line, but rather cuts pushing families below the bread line, and it's simply unacceptable. Let me say from the outset, I believe universal credit is an ideologically driven endeavour by the Conservatives, an endeavour which is deliberately punitive and will inflict harm on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. There are many aspects of universal credit which I would consider cruel and unreasonable. However, what really gives the game away is the at least five week wait before a new claimant can receive any cash that they are entitled to. The system is deliberately designed to ensure those most in need are left waiting without funds. That minimum five week wait. Indeed, the, the National Audit Office in its June 2018 report stated that in 2017, around one quarter, that's 113,000 of new claims were not paid in full on time. Late payments were delayed on average by four weeks. Staggeringly, from January to October last year, 40% of those affected by late payments waited a total of around 11 weeks or more. As for this year, as universal credit rolls out, rolls out across my city in Glasgow right now, the National Audit Office estimates that up to 338,000 new claimants will not be paid in full at the end of their first assessment period throughout 2018. That's the reality. That means many of my constituents who are already being told by a new and harsh uh, universal credit to wait five weeks before they even get a single penny they're entitled to still won't get the money. Let me make some progress, Mr Tolkien, still won't get the money after that five week wait. Now I would note that an advanced payment can, in certain circumstances, be provided by the DWP, but it's actually in reality a loan that must be paid back. Often claimants are not aware of that potential advance. When people inquire, they're asked if they can borrow money from family or friends, or if there's any other sources by which they can get money. They're actually asked that when they ask about it. When a question, what a question to ask one of my constituents, delay them and deny them their cash to a vulnerable family, and then suggest they lean on others who may very, may very well also be experiencing poverty themselves. Additionally, some of the other sources of income in a community charge eye-watering levels of interest? Are we actually asking unemployed people delay, having delayed their benefits to seek a payday loan when they're out of work? Worse still, I can assure you there's some very unsavoury people out there that some of our constituents could ask for advances on money when they're desperate, if they've been advised by the DWP to go to other sources before getting anything from them. 40% of claimants who have to wait at least five weeks do not receive an advance loan for universal credit. Some may have personal funds, some, or have family members who can assist and can afford to assist, but I worry about where the others are turning to. No, I want to make progress, Mr Tompkins. I've probably heard enough of you, to be fair. Uh, um, they, they have to go to elsewhere to survive, and I'm worried about where they're going. Universal Credit is currently constructed as a cruel system for many, deliberately delivering indebtedness by design. Now, I grew up in the 1980s where a provy check was how you paid for birthdays in my house and a catalogue was how you paid by Christmas, but you got your benefits. 
And now some of my constituents will go for the provy checks, they will go for the catalogues, and they won't have their benefits either. It's a ridiculous and it's an inhumane system. And we know the reality for too many individuals and families out there with a 15% increase in food bank use in Scotland in the five months to September this year due to the inbuilt minimum wait of five weeks. The Trussell Trust have also said that when universal credit goes live in an area, there's a demonstrable increase in demand for local food banks. On average, 12 months after the rollout of universal credit, food banks see a 52% increase in demand. On, Thursday of on Friday of last week, I held a universal credit information event in Postle Park in my constituency. And my thanks to Glasgow North West Citizens Advice, to NG Homes for their support, to councillors Gow and McLaren for attending, and to Postle Point Community Centre for hosting us. It is one of five events I have held to date, and I have worked in partnership with Citizens Advice, local housing associations, and Patrick Grady MP, as well as the local councillors. And I want to mention a number of the concerns raised at these events as they illustrate some of the other deep flaws within the universal credit system. Uh, those offering support at the information events I have attended have witnessed firsthand how individuals or groups with poor literacy skills, low or non-existent IT skills, limited or no access to computers, lack of affordability of broadband, have often been left high and dry due to the digital by default aspects of making a claim for benefits or maintaining an online journal evidencing their attempts to seek work. Inclusion Scotland indeed talks about the targeting of disabled people within this, where 35% of them have no access to the internet at all. 10% is the figure more generally across the country. This is cruel, it's inhumane and it's by design. Why not? abolish sanctions. They are quite frankly counterproductive. The PCS union who have to administer this system want sanctions abolished and don't make my constituents to a vulnerable wait five weeks. This can change and we must change it. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Maureen Watt. Mr Finlay, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. I worked as a frontline housing officer for around six years. It was a very rewarding and at times a tough job, a very good grounding for becoming a councillor and a member of this parliament because you see at first hand the daily struggles and challenges faced by people just trying to get by. And in that job, dealing with the benefits system and particularly the housing benefits system took up around half of my workload, helping tenants complete new claim forms, providing evidence of income, change of circumstances forms, advising when people started or ended a job, uh, dealing with errors and mistakes and overpayments uh, dominated my work and all impacted on the ability of the tenant and their family to afford their rent, feed their family and ultimately keep a roof over their head. And, President Officer, like almost every housing officer in the country, I had to evict people. I had to formally go through an eviction process. I think I did it a dozen times, if I can recall. And only on two occasions that I remember was the tenant actually still at the property when the eviction took place. Every other time they, they had abandoned the property in desperation or on the odd occasion they had never moved in. But in those circumstances when someone was there, it was awful. It was a horrible experience and it was desperate. And every housing officer in the country bends over backwards to avoid such a scenario. And today, those staff are dealing with people who are in crisis, dealing with individuals and families with illness or disability, a mental health crisis, debt, people who can't feed themselves or their family, people who are at real risk of destitution, and many families, many families with working parents who are doing their best but battling a system that is broken. Universal credit is in chaos. The SFHA tell us that, Poverty Alliance, Citizens Advice Bureau tell us it, councils and charities tell us it. The only people who pretend it's not are the Tory party uh, who tell us Apparently, that all of these organisations must be telling lies. Well, we, we see a series of problems with delivery. We see people uh, lose out because of the conditionality goalposts are moved. We see sanctions increasing, delays in payments, the five-week wait for initial payment, delays in ongoing payment, a lack of support for people who don't know how to use IT systems. These are all very real problems that are here and now. And all of us would support the simplification of the social security system. I'm sure we all support that principle. But this is just a cover story. It's a cover story for what this is really about. It's about the systematic 
slashing of the benefit safety net for the most vulnerable people. And it's about a redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich. It's all part of the Tory class war on the poor and so cruelly articulated by Michelle Ballantyne's offensive and discriminatory comments of two weeks ago, passively endorsed by every single Tory member. Not one of them, not one of them have spoken out about those comments. President officer, no one in Scotland or across the UK should, should face destitution or abject poverty. This is the sixth richest country in the world, for God's sake. We should be ashamed of that fact. And we should be ashamed that life expectancy has fallen for the first time in decades. And that one in four Scottish children live in poverty. We hear a lot of cliched talk about the state being a corporate parent. What kind of parent, as an act of policy, inflicts such misery on their children? What type of parent forces a £28 a week cut to households with a disabled child? What type of parent penalises their children because their mother was raped? And what type of parent supports a policy that sees evictions of families with children increase? Let me tell you what kind of parent. It's an uncaring parent. It's a neglectful parent. And it's an abusive corporate parent that does that. This is an all-out assault on the low paid, the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable. Families losing thousands of pounds a year. In Scotland, 470,000 people are not getting a real living wage of £9 an hour. An increase of 30,000 on the previous year. We've heard about the rise in food, banks use, food bank use. Kettle packs being distributed to allow people who don't have a cooker or can't afford to put it on to feed themselves. The need for crisis loans is up. Rent arrears are up. And in local government, we see services, support services, like lunch clubs and breakfast clubs and youth work decimated. We see a crisis in mental health with desperate people unable to get the support they need. It's this toxic combination of low pay, benefit cuts, and the erosion of essential public services, the ones that hold our society together, that's causing so much damage. President officer, Tory politicians have the brass neck to come to this parliament and talk about mental health, about inequality, about poverty, about housing. I tell you, it's the duty of every one of us to call them out in their hypocrisy, their unwillingness to face reality, and their disregard for people in our society who they deem as being unworthy of, su of support. President officer, finally, the Tories exist to increase equality. They exist to attack the low paid, the disabled, and the vulnerable. But let me tell you this, we will not give you a minute's peace until this appalling system is scrapped. Thank you. I call Moon Watt to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ms Watt, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And it's with a, a heavy heart that I rise to speak in this debate this afternoon. I'm ashamed, angry and despondent that in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet, we have a situation in the 21st century that the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting even more rich. When that is solely due to Westminster government policy choices, and it's so bad that it attracts international attention and condemnation from the United Nations and other bodies concerned about human rights, I am mortified. The role of universal credit, the rollout of universal credit began in Aberdeen last Monday, and to be honest, all of us in any way involved in it are just dreading the consequences whether it be all of the public sector agencies involved, Citizens Advice Scotland locally, food banks, housing providers, or my own staff, all of whom are expecting to see a rise in demand in their services. Regardless of how well prepared we are in terms of attending courses or reading up on the changes, we are all feel fearful. And I'm especially grateful to Stuart Reid, Money Advisor of Aberdeen City's Council's financial inclusion team for all his efforts to keep us informed of all the likely consequences of the universal credit rollout in Aberdeen. Presiding officer, no one would disagree that the social security system needed to be simplified as different benefits were changed over time and the system became overly com complicated. But no one, no one apart from the Tories, agree that it should have been an should be an opportunity to make the poor poorer by reducing the amount of, of money available. 
It needs to be remembered that the biggest part of the Social Security Bill is pensions. And even then, we have in the UK one of the lowest state pensions in Europe. Westminster needs to reorganise its finances to meet the demands of the, the electorate, uh, that, that, that we want to live in a society that looks after those who fall on hard times and needs that sa safety net that a universal social security system provides, as, so, as Neil Bib Bibby so uh, gra gra graphically illustrated. Instead, along with its supporters and some of the red tops, it loves to give the impression that the burden of social security payments is doled out to the feckless poor who just want to live on benefits for their whole lives. Exceptionally few people want to live with the indignity of living on benefits. That's never been my experience in all my time as, elected, as an elected politician, whether as a councillor for one of the poorest parts of Aberdeen or as an MSP with a very diverse const constituency. Yes. Neil Finlay. To be very careful in the language he chooses. It is not an indignity to live on benefits. For some people, that is the only option for them. So please be very careful when you say that. I take, the, I take the member's point, but I, what I meant was that people do not want to live on benefits. That's not their choice. Presiding officer, the stark downturn in the oil industry demonstrated starkly the need for a universal security system, where quite a number of my constituents who had been in well-paid jobs contacted me to say how appalled they were at how little they were expected to live on when they became unemployed. Until they needed it themselves, they had not realised just how poor the payouts were, and that is before the introduction of universal credit. And that's why we saw one man who came to access the food bank in his Porsche. And before the Tories say, why did he not get rid of it? It's probably on some finance scheme or other. The week in which the rollout began in Aberdeen, one of the food banks, Seafine, was already distributing its highest ever level of food parcels centrally and is considering cutting its distribution more widely in the northeast. So whether it's the Trussell Trust or my local food banks, or anyone else, there is no doubt, as the Cabinet Secretary says, that universal credit increases food bank use and makes the poor even poorer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the poor, and others have mentioned the punitive rape clause and other punitive sanctions, and no, nothing illustrated this more starkly to me than one of my constituents who fostered the child of her brother who had died and then went off to have on to have two children of her own, and she was caught by the two-child rule. Now, after the Child Property Action Group took the government to court on this and won, we are still waiting months for the government to take corrective action. But what message is this sending out to people who might consider fostering? Also, I cannot for the life of me understand why the Tories think it's successful acceptable to wait five weeks for universal credit and what folk are supposed to do in the meantime even although it, people can expect in advance they're expected to pay it back further reducing an income their income they must think that everyone gets large redundancy payments when the opposite is the case especially if you're on zero hours contracts short-term contracts or the minimum wage Presiding officer, universal credit is causing misery to thousands of people across Scotland. We have already demonstrated in Scotland that we can treat people with dignity and respect in relation to the benefits we control. It's time we had control of all of them. Thank you very much. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do welcome uh, the opportunity to contribute in today's debate. What we're talking about today is a, a welfare system that is there as a safety net for those who need extra help and support and also help those uh, into work where possible. I wanted to discuss uh, the, the rollout of universal credit because being a list MSP can have its advantages because I get to work across uh, several uh, constituencies. And I took the opportunity some time ago to, uh, to visit a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, offices there. Uh, to see how they were how they were rolling it out, and also to meet some people who had uh, moved on to, to universal credit. Now, one of the ones I went to see 
uh, had a fantastic, uh, a fantastic approach uh, to universal credit. They have a very good outreach programme. Uh, there is that recognition uh, of people who maybe have mental health issues or other, or other issues related to that who go to them rather than insist they come into the office. They do the meetings sometimes uh, either in their house or out going for a walk. Uh, and eventually they're looking towards, uh, um, uh, working towards taking the meetings back into the, the, the job centre. Recognising that there can be stages in development prior to being fit for work. And they haven't done a single sanction mm -hmm. in over two years. So, and, and one of the things that, 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 uh, that, that came across very strongly when I was speaking to uh, the, the, the group was that, there's that there was an initial fear around universal credit because of the rhetoric uh, in the media led by politicians. And that actual relief and recognition of the system they are now on is a much improved one than the complicated one that they left. Absolutely. Now, in contrast to that, I visited, I visited another one where there is an insistence that all applicants appear at the job centre which is leading those, some of those people into that, that, that anxiety, missed appointments, and all the issues that then ensue. Now, what I want to know is why two job centres, not that far apart, are receiving the same instruction and framework and managing to develop two completely different policies. Now, if we are really interested in developing that fair welfare system, that's where we should be doing our work. We should be working out why they can take that framework and come up with two different approaches. Now, and there are millions and millions of pounds that go unclaimed every year. Now, that is a failure of the system. And another area we should and, and could be focused on if we have a genuine interest uh, of, of, of for those in the system at the core of our thought process. I have to say that there are no social security will ever be perfect, of course, and, and there will always be cracks in the system. And there will be those who would slip through those cracks. But what we need to do is make sure that we work to close those gaps. I will take an intervention. Keith Brown. Can I thank the member for taking intervention and given what he's just said, would he confirm whether it's his position that universal credit uh, has not caused an increase in homelessness, hou housing arrears, or as the Trussell Trust say, an increase in food bank use? Is it his position that's not happened under universal credit? Brian Whittle. Can I thank uh, Keith Brown for intervention because that's actually something I wanted to, to, to intervene on earlier on. My, uh, my, uh, one of my local constituencies is in East Ayrshire, and uh, when I was recently visited our uh, uh, centre mm -hmm. there, uh, uh, for, uh, food bank centre there, uh, we were informed is that over the past year they had managed to do a reduction of 30% in food bank usage. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that is, is that, that that message is not getting out. What they have done is they've managed to gather, when somebody comes over the, the, the threshold, they have managed to gather uh, services round about that, including the DWP, mm -hmm to make sure that uh, uh, all help that should be available to them and they understand, uh, uh, they understand that. So I think when we're discussing this, that's something that, that sits very, uh, very strongly with me in that, that perhaps the, the, the different approaches across all the different areas, uh, we should be learning from it. But I do think though that that, that message hasn't gone out because I think somewhere along the line, it doesn't fit certain political rhetoric and agenda. Now, one of the things I did, well, last, fri last Friday I, uh, uh, I visited the credit union and I think that's a, as an organisation that uh, doesn't get enough, uh, uh, enough oxygen. Uh, they're offering uh, help in a small way to start with through small loans initially uh, and, and helping them in, in developing that management of money. And I think this in turn helps to develop a better cre credit rating as they move forward through that process. Something we all take for granted, uh, uh, developing that kind of life skill for those who have not had that opportunity is surely a must. But what I would say is obvious from the mess that Labour created when they were in power that the system had to change as the then uh, Minister responsible for welfare said, and I quote, uh, we agree that reform is needed. We also agree that the system should incentivise work, that it should be simpler, and of course, that it must be affordable. It's worth restating that we believe that our overall model of universal credit has some merit. That, of course, was Keith Brown uh, who then was the Minister responsible for welfare in 2012. It seemed to me that every budget that Gordon Brown brought forward endeavoured to complicate a system more and more. And we had a large proportion of the working population eligible, eligible for some kind of tax credit, even those on a decent salary. It was unwieldy, massively complicated, and responsible for so many claimants falling into debt. As for the SNP, they have the goal to bring this to the Chamber, I have to say, when all they have done is duck the issue at every opportunity, 
Let's be frank, Deputy Presiding Officer, this has been on their uh, agenda since the announcement of the independence referendum in 2012. Let us remind the Chamber that the SNP said they could devolve a working welfare state in 18 months. Mm -hmm. So after much capping, they're getting control of a third of the working age benefit, which is circa three billion. Yep. The first thing they do is hand it back for an initial three years, and then for a further two years yep. mm -hmm. to the end of this parliamentary term. So after nine years of consideration, we have still to hear an SNP policy. Because, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's easier to discuss what you intend to do with warm words instead of explaining the consequences of taking responsibility. Because the SNP are discovering this is hard, but so is government. This is not a debate. This is not a debate about welfare. The members Deputy concluding. This is not a debate about welfare, Deputy Presiding Officer. It should be. It's a debate about deflection, about abdication of responsibility and grievance. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's poor fare and Scotland deserves better. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I call Alec Neill to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr Neill, please. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. I've heard in this debate so far that the aims of the universal credit is really threefold. One is to uh, uh, allow those people who are fit and able to work to get back into work. Secondly, to ensure that work pays, and the best way to do that is actually a real living wage, not the Tory version, the real version. And the third thing is to simplify the benefit system. And can I say right across the chamber, I think everybody agrees with those three objectives. But there is a fourth objective, which is very important in any benefit system. And that is that during the period people are on benefit, whether it's for a short period or a lifetime, we have to use the benefit system to ensure that their standard and quality of living is as good as the rest of the community. It's not a safety system giving people the minimum so they need to live hand to mouth. Every other country in Europe has a social security system that prides itself in ensuring that during a period of unemployment, during a period of sickness, during a period when people have to live on benefit, their quality and standard of living is up to scratch. And they do that for two reasons. They do it, first of all, because in principle and from a humane point of view, it is absolutely the right thing to do. But they also do it for beneficial reasons for society. There is report after report showing, for example, if you take the Danish social security system, which is one of the highest paying to people during a period of unemployment, it actually pays the state to pay higher levels of benefit during unemployment than the pittance people get in the United Kingdom. Because what the evidence shows is that people then take the time not just to find a job, but to find the right job for them, to retrain, to get a new career, to make sure that when they go in, back into work, it's the right kind of work. What the system does in this country is forces people into short-term work, into antisocial work, into low-paid work, into inappropriate work for their skills. And the result is we get this continual churn that, unlike in Denmark, when people go into work, they're usually in that job for years before they end up uh, unemployed again. Whereas in this country, we typically see our people end up back in the brew very shortly after getting into work because it's been done completely the wrong way. So we need to not just deal with universal credit, we need to completely rethink in this country, both Scotland and the United Kingdom, what we need our social security system to do. But in terms even of their own objectives, of simplifying the system, of getting more people into work, and of uh, incentivizing people to work, universal credit, I will in a minute, and I will, a universal credit fails in all three objectives. What it's done isn't get more people into work proportionately, as the Cabinet Secretary said. We have seen an increase in population 
of 3 million. And many of the numbers going into work are the people who are coming into the labor market for the first time, either through immigration or through uh, the reaching a working age. So the reality is when you look at universal credit, what has it done? It has driven hundreds of thousands of people into dire poverty and in some extreme cases to suicide. Adam Tompkins. Mr Neil, for giving way. I, I always enjoy listening him, to him in, the, in these debates because I didn't agree with the last thing he said, but I agree with a lot, a lot of what he said. But what he, what, what, does he not agree with me that the reality is that under universal credit, claimants are more likely than they were under the legacy system to be in work? They're more likely than they were under the legacy benefits to stay in work longer, and they are more likely to be earning higher wages than they were under the legacy system. Three reasons why universal credit, despite all of the rhetoric to the contrary, is working on the ground. Alec, I don't, think, give you your I time don't think the evidence overall actually has proven that. And, and what I see with universal credit is actually quite the opposite. That it's driving people into poverty. I mean, let's like take this thing about not getting money for five weeks. And, you know, I'm not saying the Tories are evil. I, I am absolutely sure that when Ian Duncan Smith designed this, that he actually was well-intentioned, although George Osborne completely ruined it by making £12 billion pounds worth of cuts to universal credit, only a small percentage of which has been reinstated last week by the Chancellor. But if you are in a low-paid job, as most people in universal credit have been, they have no savings. They usually have probably debt when they go on to benefit. They have nothing to rely on. They don't own their own home, so they can't raise money in the back of the value of the house. These are people typically who even in work were living hand to mouth. That's why 70% of the children in poverty are living in households where somebody is in full-time work. These are not, not only not rich people, these are typically already poor people. And to starve them for five weeks before they get a penny is one of the cruelest things that could ever be done. And the reality is one of the things the Scottish Government is doing, and I was responsible for this as a minister, is that we are going to pay universal credit within two weeks. Indeed, we looked at whether it could be done within one week and the computer systems we're inheriting from the DWP doesn't allow you to do that. Otherwise, we would have made it one week. Now, that's just about being more humane. There's no more money involved, but you do it humanely. And the reality is that this has not been done humanely. It's been a shambles from day one. It continues to be a shambles and it utterly fails every basic test that you yourselves have set for it. Thank you very much. A call Claire Adamson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week I had um, the pleasure of visiting a local business professional office suppliers in Motherwell um, to celebrate Living Wage Week and um, see that the wonderful job that they're doing in supporting their uh, employees in um, fair work and in decent employment. Um, but how very different it is for many people who will be struggling on minimum wage and working in the gig economy, many of whom will be de also dependent on benefits. Because we must remember that for many people living in poverty and relying on, uh, on benefits, they are in work. Um, I am very... Um, uh, sad to be here again talking about the problems with universal credit. In the previous term of this parliament, I served on the Welfare Reform Committee and we did some extensive work into the impact of the welfare reform on people in our society. And many of the problems that have been discussed today, the issues of um, single payments, the issues of um, housing benefit, not something we've fixed in Scotland, thankfully, housing benefit not being paid directly to landlords, all of these issues were um, highlighted in the pilots and the Welfare Reform uh, Committee visited the, uh, one of the pilots in, in, in uh, Highlands and Islands Council to see some of the impact that these reforms were having on them. So none of these problems are new 
and yet we are still faced with them repeating and repeating and repeating and causing misery for our citizens in Scotland. I really want to highlight some of the work that the Welfare Reform Society did, the Welfare Reform Committee did, because what we identified was that it's, it's, you can't look at a simple identification of what a claimant looks like. Many people fall into different categories because they are in work or out of work or they have different personal circumstances. But one of the bits of work we did was about women and social security. And the, the committee had evidence suggesting that the, there's an existing inequality for women which has been aggravated by the reforms in the social security system. It includes issues around childcare, occupational segregation, pink collar jobs as they're called, the gender pay gap and women's role as primary carers in society. And research at that time by the House of Commons Library stated that since 2010, 26 billion pounds worth of cuts made to benefits, tax credits, pay and pensions, 85% of this had fallen on women. 26 billion pounds had been taken from women's incomes due to these cuts. We also know that women are twice as dependent on social security as men with 20% of women income coming from benefits and, the and what was the tax credit system. And they also have fewer financial assets to fall back on when life happens. And many of the, my colleagues this afternoon have talked about how unpredictable life can be when people lose their jobs unexpectedly. And we've talked a lot about the five week delay. I'm, I'm very conscious that we've just had a major announcement of job losses in Dundee. But for some people facing redundancy towards Christmas, that could mean five weeks in a period over Christmas and New Year where they're faced with absolutely no recourse and in income. And I think that's a shocking state of affairs for any country to be in. And some of my other colleagues have mentioned the impact on children. And really, um, this is something that I, I feel so strongly about because um, a child shouldn't be means tested. A child shouldn't be valued and of what their parents circumstances are when they were born each and every child should be entitled to the same benefit and that's why i find the two child uh, limit so disappointing that that has not been addressed because you know the, the support for for children is about keeping those children out of poverty and helping their families now um, if we could address some of the points that i've heard this afternoon um, Brian Whittle said that he'd, he'd visited DWPs and saw a, a DWP um, office and, and had seen different um, types of policies being uh, implemented by the, the officers. Well, I hope he's written to his government because it is their responsibility. And the fact that there's that variation is, is an absolute indictment of how broken this system is and how badly it's been administered by his government and the DWP. And I also want to to talk about the, what's been said about some of the use of food banks. And, and <laughs> I just find it unbelievable that we're talking about food banks as if they're part of what society should be about. It's her shame that there are any food banks. And of course, reduction in the need for food banks and their use is to be welcomed. And the fact that one food bank was bringing in agencies, those agencies were probably using the Scottish Welfare Fund to use to help people. Mitigation of £100 million a year from this government to clean up the mess of what universal credit is doing for people in, in our society. And I, and I think about this, children in particular have been hit so hard by this. A couple, um, a lone parent with one dependent child is likely to you lose about £1,770 a year. And um, a, a, a lone parent with two or more dependent children will lose even more. And when we look at the effect on individual incomes, and um, Brian Whittle mentioned North Ayrshire. North Ayrshire, some of the people in there are likely to lose 400, and the average family will lose 400, 540 pounds a year as a result. And you can see that the impact is actually higher on the poorer areas per household. Um, can I just finish? Um, President officer by, by saying that I really don't understand how broken and morally bankrupt a system has to be before it's recognised. But um, I don't think the United Nations are involved in rhetoric or political agendas. And it is them that have said the United Nations rights of the person with disabilities that have called out this government for their failure to look after people with disabilities in this country. So is everybody wrong? Jackie Bailey, followed by Alistair Allen. Presiding officer, poverty in Scotland is getting worse. 
About one million people are living in poor households, including something like 230,000 children. And the majority of them are in working households. What a damning indictment on our economy and the precarious nature of employment that is. It is a simple fact that salaries have not kept pace with inflation and at the same time, the cost of living is rising and people are quite simply struggling to get by. And what's the response of the Tory UK government? Well, instead of pursuing tax dodgers who owe millions of pounds their intent on penalising the poor. And if we take universal credit, probably the worst example of Tory welfare reform, rolled out in Argyll and Butte last month, and it's being rolled out this month in Western Bartonshire. And when universal credit was introduced, as others have touched on, it had three aims. To simplify the system, reduce poverty, and support people into employment. Presiding officer, it fails on all three counts. The system is still complicated, beset with delays, claimants having to wait five weeks, if they're lucky, before getting their first payment. Food banks are reporting rises in the numbers needing help, and there is a direct correlation with the rollout of universal credit. So poverty has increased, not reduced under the Tories. They have cut the amount of benefits paid to some of the most vulnerable in our society. And let me give you just two examples of that. Firstly, the disability premium. This has been cut by two thirds. And secondly, the introduction of the two child cap. You know, it reminds me of communist China's one child policy, morally abhorrent. But now even the Chinese have abolished that. Perhaps the Tories could bring themselves to take a leaf out of China's example and abolish the two-child cap. And as for supporting people into employment, the in-work conditionality is totally inflexible. If you work in precarious employment in any case, the stress of searching for more work whilst holding down an insecure job places real financial pressure on people, not something the Tories understand. But in short, presiding officer, universal credit is an unmitigated disaster. It's making people already in poverty poorer. The UK government needs to stop the rollout now and halt the managed migration of existing claimants on in-work benefits. And I want to point out another flaw touched on by Claire Adamson and Alison Johnson. And the context is that poverty is gendered. It is the case that the majority of poor people are female. Women are twice as dependent on social security as men. And we know that the gender pay gap contributes to women <coughs> being low paid and facing poverty. Now the Work and Pension Select Committee in a recent report noted that the default policy of single monthly payments per household risks the entire family income, including money meant for children going into an abusive partner's account. The woman can feel trapped, dependent on an abusive partner for money, which he then uses to control the relationship. It makes it so much harder for them to escape from the abuse. Close the gap in their briefing for this debate noted that 89% of women who experience domestic abuse also experience financial abuse. So dual payments need to be the norm, not the exception. Let me turn, presiding officer, to the rollout of universal credit in Western Bartonshire and say to Michelle Ballantyne, this is the situation on the ground. I want to start by paying tribute to the Western Bartonshire Citizens Advice Bureau, the Council, and Western Bartonshire Food Share for their efforts in preparing for this. Whilst there is immediate concern about delay in payments, the real concern is for January and February, when the consequences of spending choices over Christmas come home to roost. There is a real fear of housing debt being an issue, particularly for those receiving their rent direct instead of it going to the landlord and I was asked that this is looked at again. The two principal mechanisms that we will use locally to help people will be through local food banks who are gearing up for this, and the second is the Scottish Welfare Fund. Now, the Scottish Government has the power and the means to help, and of course the UK Government should halt the rollout of universal credit, and to quote John Swinney, we shouldn't let them off the hook, because their welfare reforms have been nothing short of brutal. But we cannot, in all conscience, wring our hands, say how terrible it is, but stand by and do nothing. So I have one final request of the Scottish Government, and I say this as gently as I can. Instead of 
cutting the money for the Scottish Welfare Fund in my area, which is the consequence of the reprofiling and indeed the real terms um, freeze that there's been, a little more money available to help those experiencing immediate difficulties as a result of universal credit, I think would be in order. Indeed, the Scottish Parliament Social Security Committee has re recommended this, and I believe they're right. Presiding officer, at the centre of all of this are people and families struggling to cope. They need practical assistance, they need it now, and we mustn't lose sight of them. Alistair Allen, followed by Keith Brown. Presiding officer, as we've heard, uh, the UK government's tax and welfare changes since 2010 are estimated to have increased the number of children living in relative poverty in Scotland by 8%. The Citizens Advice Bureau estimates that the primary reason for the people they work for being in rent arrears is they are having been moved onto universal credit. They recorded that 79% of people on universal credit were in arrears compared to 29% of the other people that they deal with. Those of us on Parliament's Social Security Committee have heard evidence in only the last couple of weeks from food banks who anticipate a rise in demand for their services in every area where universal credit is being rolled out. Indeed, in my own constituency, uh, universal credit went live there at the end of September, and I know that the food bank there uh, is braced uh, for growing demand. Presiding officer, as others have, I think, alluded to today, the Conservatives are, I am afraid, asking the rest of us all to suspend our disbelief and for us all to see no connections between any of these facts. Last week on the Social Security Committee, we heard some shocking evidence from the PCS union about the apparent unpreparedness of DWP even to begin to cope with some of the changes that lie ahead. It is unclear to take just one example of the union's concerns how the tax credit system is to be moved from HMRC to DWP anything like seamlessly. And just as concerning is that many people in receipt of tax credits who do not presently even see themselves as being part of the benefit system are suddenly going to be dealing with the DWP and in many cases it seems quite uh, likely that they may have to reapply for something they thought they'd already been awarded. And as others have mentioned today, there is of course the five week wait for payment for universal credit. Uh, and I, I know I cannot be the only member uh, of this chamber who will have encountered a family in this situation, a family trying to live off literally nothing whatsoever for a period of five weeks. The Trussell Trust have found that 70% of people in this situation found themselves in significant debt as a result. And it really would be surprising, presiding officer, if they had found anything else. Now, the, the Tory Social Security spokesperson today quoted IFS and the Resolution Foundation uh, as confirming uh, universal credit as being more generous than the old system. Uh, I, I do feel the member uh, may be quoting rather selectively there because IFS notes that universal credit will in fact result uh, in a third, of, a third of households entitled to universal credit being at least £1,000 a year worse off under universal credit. Uh, and I think uh, those facts speak for themselves. But it is worth considering um, what all of this means in human terms. In, view, uh, in the view of Inclusion Scotland, uh, UK welfare cuts have had a disproportionate and discriminatory impact on disabled people. Uh, I quote them when they say that they believe that over 50% of all cuts uh, are falling on disabled people and their families. Inclusion Scotland, who represent Scotland's disability organisations, have made a very strongly worded representation to all of us as parliamentarians on this. They have called the UK government's welfare agenda a grave and systematic breach of disabled people's human rights. And of course, the UN uh, have said something similar, warning of, quote, a human catastrophe. Inclusion Scotland conclude that the cumulative impact of the UK government's welfare cuts is resulting in deepening levels of poverty, destitution, worsening mental health, suicides and deaths. And I, I did note that there was much uh, uh, heckling when somebody else quoted such a scenario uh, earlier on when it, came, when it came to the view of the Tory benches. But I, I should say that those are the views uh, of Inclusion Scotland. 
The first question is probably what can this Parliament do about that? And the broader question perhaps is does it care? Well, on the first question, we have power in Scotland to make changes in very small areas around the edges of universal credit, and important powers though they may be. But beyond that, there are of course regular calls, and we heard them today, for this Parliament to mitigate all the effects of the UK government's benefits reforms on some of Scotland's poorest families. Now, of course, as uh, we know, £125 million worth of such mitigation has been spent by the Scottish Government uh, this year, and it is only right that we, uh, as a Parliament, as a Government, have tried uh, to take the edge off uh, the most extreme of Westminster's measures. But we do need to be straight. Some £3.7 billion pounds is expected to come out of the UK, out of the UK Government's uh, social security spend in Scotland by 2021. No amount of mitigation by this Parliament from the resources it has to spend on devolved public services can possibly mitigate for that or make the Tories' damaging benefits reforms go away. Conclusion, con concluding, uh, presiding officer, uh, the bigger question, of course, is does the Parliament care? Well, uh, Presiding officer, I, I wish I could say that there was unanimity across the chamber in answer to that question. Uh, we've, we've listened to what the Tories have had to say today. And I can really only conclude in view of some of their recent uh, revealing outbursts from some benches about people and benefits that I can't uh, in any honesty claim that all parties in this parliament do care about this matter. But I hope that the rest of us who do will continue to make our views loudly known. <laughs> Call Keith Brown, who is the last of the open debate speeches. Keith Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. My constituency of Clipmanish and Dunblane was an early adopter of universal credit back in 2015, and as such, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and to highlight the impact the policy has had on the people that I represent. There is no part that is, there is no doubt, rather, as part of the wider welfare reform agenda, the introduction of universal credit has been the biggest change the welfare system in this country has undergone. And in order to assess the impact of the rollout in my local area, on the 7th of September, I hosted a summit in Alloa, in the town hall. It was well attended by local councillors from different parties, officers from both Clipmanager and Stirling councils, Clipmanager and Stirling citizens' advice bureaus, local food banks, the poverty lines, and the local third sector. I also invited the two Tory MPs who represent my constituency at Westminster and who are more than willing on any occasion to stand up in the House of Commons and extol the virtues of universal credit. Stephen Kerr, for example, stating just a few weeks ago, I am grateful to be a proponent of universal credit. And Luke Graham, MP, claiming earlier this year that universal credit is a positive and transformational reform, which I suspect will come as news to many of my uh, constituents. Unsurprisingly, both Tory MPs declined the opportunity to attend the summit, unwilling it would seem to listen to the actual facts of this toxic Tory policy. But it was clear from the evidence presented by all those who... Yes, I will do. Adam Tomkins. Very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. I wonder if he would agree with these words. Uh, we, agree, we agree that reform is needed. We also agree that the system should incentivise work, that it should be simpler, and, of course, that it must be affordable. And it's worth restating that we believe that the overall model of universal credit has some merits. I wonder if he would agree with those words, because those words were his, uttered in this chamber on the 21st of March, praising the virtues of universal credit. What a complete Keith waste Brown. of an intervention. You've already heard from all around the chamber the shared values of trying to make it more simple, trying to encourage people into work. I think we understand that point. That does not excuse the effect of the policy that you and your party are proposing. It was clear to the evidence presented by all those who attended uh, the summit I mentioned that the system is fundamentally flawed. It penalises the most vulnerable people in our communities, causing financial hardship and extreme distress to many, uh, many claimants. And since the full rollout of universal credit locally in my area, both council areas have seen, despite what Brian Whittle says, a significant rise in the level of claimants who have rent arrears, with nine out of ten tenants in Clipmanishire claiming universal credit accruing rent arrears in 2017. The average debt per universal credit case nearly double that of the non-UC cases. A similar situation observed in Stirling Council, where rent arrear rates also are, uh, uh, were on the rise. In 99 cases, Stirling Council tenants had arrears solely comprised of an arrear accumulated while waiting for their first universal payment, uh, credit payment to arrive. A record number of people having applied for crisis loans and a steady increase in the use of food banks and the denial by Brian Whittle that the Trussell Trust might be saying something other than rhetoric when they point out the direct link between universal credit and the increase in food banks I think will haunt uh, Brian Whittle in his local area. 
There's also been a surge in the number of people using the local services, uh, 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 such as the Citizens Advice Bureau. And can I say, there are five Tories here. I'm happy to give way to any single Tory who wants to stand up just now and say they agree with Theresa May that austerity is over. I thought not. Nobody in my constituency believes, and certainly nobody on universal credit. Even as, uh, as we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary, it's going to take two to three years for some of these most basic changes uh, to happen. Austerity is still going to be there for these people. And the system is not simple. Adam Tonkin's point to me that we should support a simplification. It's not simple. The Common Select Committee reports it's not simple. It's unreliable even for the most capable of claimants who have little or no support built in uh, for those that need additional help. It leaves local councils, food banks and voluntary services to pick up the strain. And just to highlight one or two of the issues raised by those in attendance at the summit I've referred to, the fact that claiming universal credit is a difficult and complex process for everyone was highlighted repeatedly. I also have to say, both for local councils and the Scottish Government, we also have to improve the way in which we make it as accessible as possible. And simply telling people that they have to use uh, an IT system to do that is not enough. We have to make sure the support is there. The representative from Club Manager of Citizens Advice Bureau stated it can take hours to make a claim, even for those with IT skills, and it's a nightmare for most people, uh, not only for those with complex needs. And that's where we're going to see it really bite, when people with complex needs are exposed to this system. Uh, representatives in the third sector shared their experience of supporting vulnerable people through the process of claiming universal credit, highlighting the difficulties faced by people, especially who have learning difficulties. There's also the issue of bank accounts, with people often trapped in a difficult situation of having no money to get an ID in order to get a bank account, in order to get uh, and receive benefit. And I've mentioned before in this chamber, in my constituency, we don't have a single RBS or Clydesdale Bank in the first place. It's also alarming to note, as I mentioned previously, the sanction rates in the two job centres relevant to my constituency have risen significantly and progressively since they received full rollout uh, as the claimant count, uh, count has grown. So while the Tories, both in my constituency and across the country, continue to be enthusiastic cheerleaders for universal credit, denouncing any criticism is mere rhetoric. The UN, the Trussell Trust, the Common Select Committee, it's all just rhetoric according to the Tories. And that can be, I suppose, the only way that they feel they can deal with this situation. I have five here who've barely lifted their eyes during the entire debate. I think you're thoroughly ashamed of it. And if you are ashamed of it, you should be speaking up. If you feel, and I think some of you must feel, this is a bad system, there are people that are committing suicide, there is real misery amongst children, and you're sitting there and saying nothing, I suggest that you go down to Westminster, grab your colleague Tracy Crouch, and see if you can borrow the Tory spine for a day. Because at least she had the spine to stand up for something which she knew was having an effect on poverty across the country. We should see some of that spine in this, in this uh, group here. You know it's not working. You can see that for yourselves. You never said it before your Chancellor agreed it a couple of weeks ago. You never said it then, you should say it now. It's not working, you should halt the rollout and you should admit the fact you've got the policy completely wrong. We now move to the, the closing speeches and can I remind all members they should always speak through the chair and uh, call Alex Cole Hamilton quite tight on timings for the closing speeches please, up to six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to close for my party in what I think has been a, an illuminating debate, and it offers me the opportunity to restate my party support, both for the amendment in the name of Mark Griffin and that of Alison Johnson, and for the, the motion as a whole. I think the Cabinet Secretary uh, set the tone uh, in the landscape in which this debate is being conducted when she evoked the image of the gentleman forced to uh, light, his, light and warm his home by candlelight. I am haunted by that. I am haunted by that. It is the delay in particular, the five week delay before any cash is forthcoming that has created uh, images like that and the demand, increasing demand that we have heard about today on food banks. And it is the structural flaws that around universal credit and its rollout which have created that situation that we should in this place be using uh, bureaucratic words like starvation is astonishing. That's Dickensian. Deputy Presiding Officer. And what struck me most uh, was how far away those aspects of mitigation hinted at by the UK government actually are. And I think the uh, Cabinet Secretary was quite right to call that out, that these are three years hence when people are suffering right now. Put simply, if you recognise the system is already broken, either fix it now or stop it entirely. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne uh, started by suggesting that debates like these are politically motivated. It was a point that was uh, echoed by Brian Whittle, but when her government refuses to acknowledge complaint after complaint and calamity after calamity in the rollout of this system, 
then I'm afraid that calling it out in a political arena such as, like, such as this is all that we have left to us. And she laid out the original drivers, and I agree with them as I agreed with them in 2010, but they are no longer the original drivers behind this system. They do not recognize uh, things like in-work poverty or delays that we've already covered or the iniquities of uh, paying uh, into one bank account where abuse is a factor uh, or spousal abuse is a factor. Uh, Bob Doris addressed in empirical terms how we've moved from a reform agenda to a cuts agenda. He referenced the £3.7 billion that are now gone from the system. And that is exactly what my amendment speaks to because it underscores the difference uh, of intent between the governments of, of that which my party was part and that which followed immediately after in 2015 and brought around that punishing budget to universal credit. I commend Neil Finlay on the passion of his contribution, his reflection um, and uh, of our dereliction of duty as a corporate parent really spoke to me. Uh, it's something I've long argued since before I even came into this uh, place. And, and I think like Mark Griffin, who uh, offered a, a very powerful speech in terms of his own um, uh, particular family example was, was really compelling in terms of the, um, the understanding of the lived experience of the, these reforms and what that means. And it's clearly shaped a good part of Neil's life, it's clearly shaped a, a good part of Mark's life. I'm very good, glad that they are channeling that uh, to, to this day. This is no longer about a system which is unravelling, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's about a system which is the fundamental fabric of which is ruined and unmendable. And I think George Adam picked up on that in, in his addressing those, I think, ill-chosen words of Michelle Ballantyne when she talked about the fact that we need to test and to learn. First of all, these are human lives that we're talking about. They're not lab rats. And second of all, we're trying to show that where the system has failed those tests, but your government still refuses to learn from that and pushes back. Uh, and I think it's something you should take away and reflect on. Uh, Alison Johnson anchored her speech into um, the, the not insubstantial cuts that the July 2015 budget uh, brought about. And again, I referenced the fact that exactly speaks to uh, our amendment. But I, I really appreciate the Green Amendment in the fact that it referenced the very gendered nature of the impact of these reforms. It was something that picked up once again eloquently by Jackie Bailey and by Claire Adamson. Um, and I go back to that fact that, that finance is still used as a tool of coercive control and abusive relationships. This system has to recognize that it is there to serve the most vulnerable people in our society. And I can think of very few more vulnerable people than those who are abuse survivors still stuck in abusive spousal relationships. Again, Annie Wells took us back to basic principles. And, and once again, I say, you know, we support those principles, but those principles are far adrift of where we are to this day. Uh, one of my favorite speeches in this was from Alex Neal. He often makes, I enjoy his contributions immensely, but I think the international comparison that he made was very important. He reminded us that social mobility in, in places like Denmark and other European countries isn't just about moving people out of the unemployment column. It's about giving them a meaningful new start at life and economic self-management and sustainability. I think it's important we hang on to that when we consider the early foothills of our own social security system in this country. Presiding officer, I will conclude with this. The system is clearly broken. That's evidenced in the early rollout areas like those constituencies like that of Keith Brown and others. And we have to listen to the lived experience of those who have suffered because of it. Now, I'm not a particularly religious person, but there is a passage in scripture that I have reflected on before when we talk about the welfare state and social security. And in the book of Jeremiah, there's a phrase that says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Again, I'm not religious, but that really speaks to me in terms of the uh, first principles, that important starting point from which any social security system or indeed any other public policy that we design in this place should cling. And we are a country mile from that now. Thank you. Alison Johnson, for up to six minutes, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'd like to start by confirming that we will be supporting the government motion at decision time as well as the Lib Dem amendment and the Labour amendment. We will not be supporting the Conservative amendment. Um, the Cabinet Secretary focused um, on many of the flaws of universal credit, not least the five-week wait 
um, and pointed out rather alarmingly that the DWP don't expect any significant improvement. That is rather horrifying. She also spoke of the uncertainty self-employed people will experience under this policy, those whose earnings vary from month to month. I think one of the most daunting aspects of her contribution was, was when she informed Parliament that 190 women have filled in a form to prove that conception wasn't consensual and that Citizens Advice Bureau have filled in a form where they note that one of their clients was suffering starvation while waiting for universal, cre for cr universal credit. Now, Michelle Ballantyne then went on to point out that no one is suggesting that universal credit is faultless. Um, and that, of course, universal credit has its problems. Really? I mean, Alex Cole Hamilton has picked up on the fact that we have focused on the gendered nature of the cuts. And he also pointed out that finance is used as a tool of coercive control. I can't actually think of a better example of that than the two-child limit and the rape clause. I'm not entirely surprised by Michelle Ballantyne's response to this. Um, I notice she's not responding at the moment. Uh, a few months ago, Esther McVeigh came to speak to the Social Security Committee and we had a chance to question her. And I asked the Secretary of State, as a minister, are you comfortable with the idea that a woman has to prove non-consensual conception to access an entitlement? And in her response, Esther McVeigh said, there is potentially double support there. They will get the money that they need and perhaps an outlet that they might need. This is not the outlet that women who have been traumatised in such a shocking way need. Mark Griffin, um, Mark Griffin's contribution um, was very, very powerful indeed. He pointed out that this parliament has to step in and that is absolutely right. I agree that it does. This is a devolved parliament. We have responsibility to ensure that those who live in this country have every opportunity to succeed and equality is key and it's difficult to experience the opportunities that your friends and neighbours have when you are suffering from abject poverty. So this parliament should and must do all that it can but isn't it very very frustrating and I speak as someone who joined the campaign for a devolved parliament before I joined a political party it's very, very frustrating when this parliament is constantly called upon to sort out the chaos that is being inflicted on people in this country by another parliament. Um, that said, I will continue to push strongly and to ask this government to adopt universal child benefit top up. Um, and at the very least, as Mark Griffin asked, that we see the income supplement fast tracked. I mean, Annie Wells, she spoke about devolved powers. You know, I really would like to understand what Annie Wells thinks the, po the, po the point of this parliament is. I hear so little of vision coming from those benches and always, and Brian Whittle joined in, a cry for this parliament to mitigate Westminster's cuts. Surely, surely you must have more of a vision than that, certainly, Mr Whittle. Brian Whittle. Yeah, I thank the member for taking the intervention. I think you'll find that I, I uh, discussed the way that the universal credit has been rolled out and, and the framework. But what I would suggest to you, what would we do? This three billion pounds worth uh, was, was given to this parliament, and the first thing they did was give it back to Westminster. How can you complain about that? Alison Johnson. Mr. Whittle, I'm sure you're well aware that what's been delivered to this parliament and through universal credit is nothing but cuts. Cuts to people's living standard, cuts to the quality of life, cuts to the most vulnerable in society. Um, Bob Doris and Neil Finlay both spoke of sanctions. And what we have to remember with universal credit is unprecedented. We've never had in-work conditionality. Now, even when you get a job, you're still not trying hard enough. Don't the Conservatives realise that if higher paid work was available, those seeking work would be highly likely to be in those higher paid jobs? We also heard last week from PCS, who spoke to the committee, of the impact that cuts, cuts in the number of job centres, cuts in the number of staff working in those job centres is having. How can work coaches help people find higher paid jobs when they're struggling under a ludicrous caseload? Um, Neil Finlay pointed out that, that no one on the Conservative benches has picked up on Michelle Ballantyne's contribution um, a week or two ago. And do you know that the, um, 
I think the response to that is, is because really it is Conservative Party policy and they are quite comfortable with it. Um, Alex Neil, I agree wholeheartedly. We shouldn't be offering people the bare minimum on which to survive when they need support. We should be ensuring that they have support that enables them to contribute in a way that maintains their human dignity and helps them into those well-paid jobs. Um, Presiding Officer Jackie Bailey spoke about people budgeting for Christmas. I mean, on universal credit, that is a very big ask indeed. We as a parliament do have a role to make sure that everyone can enjoy a, a decent quality of living. We will continue to campaign for increased this child benefit, but we will also continue con to condemn Westminster's cuts when that is the right thing to do. Thank you. Pauline McNeill, up to six minutes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Universal credit is in crisis, and what's more, the benches opposite know that it is in crisis. It took Esther McVeigh to contradict the Downing Street line only a few weeks ago, when at least she admitted that there were losers in the universal credit system. And I'm with Keith Brown on this. In all the debates I've done in this parliament, I've hardly heard a word of criticism in any real sense from the benches opposite. Of the seven reforms or eight reforms that we've heard, is that not an indication that the test to unlearn is absolutely, utterly failing? And like George Adams, I do actually find it quite insulting that you say that we should support a system which tests and learns. Who are the people we're talking about here? The people you're testing to learn are the people who need the most support from the state and it is really not acceptable to say that that is how we're going to adjust a deeply flawed system. In fact, it was <laughs> Heidi Allen, South Cambridge, who has been the most outspoken on this. And even the injection of £1.7 billion, she says it is not enough and we need to be honest with ourselves that it is not working I don't actually believe, and I would like to hear if Michelle Ballantyne is saying that somehow behind the scenes they made some representations, I'd like to hear it. It was 38 degrees analysis that said, and so there's been some accusation that there's political rhetoric around this. Well, I'm sure you know that there are 39 Tory MPs whose seats and their majorities are outweighed by universal claimants. So I wonder who are the ones that are playing politics with this. Ian Duncan Smith, who is the original architect, I mean, I actually think that at least he had some ambition here. This system that we or you are defending now is nothing like the system I believe that he wanted to design. I think it's a million miles away from it. So you don't want to just tinker with the previous welfare system. Well, you certainly did not. You've removed billions of pounds out of the universal credit system. There are mounting rent arrears. The use of food banks is up. The entire system of people relying on tax credits and child tax credits is completely overturned. And as you've heard from Alison Johnson and others, the waiting times built into the system alone is inflicting deep poverty on a daily basis to thousands of people. So you certainly did not tinker with it, that's for sure. These design flaws are hurting people. The facts speak for themselves. The Resolution Foundation says that on average, families are losing £1,200 a year by 2020. And I do think, I have said there are good features about the system. The online system isn't all that bad, but it does penalise many who are not on the internet. So there's still a lot to fix. It seems to me extraordinary that you would build into a system that you'll get transitional protection unless your family circumstances change. So if your partner leaves you, or you leave them, or you stop work, or you join households with another person who has children, and incidentally, the two-child cap will apply to them, um, you will lose your transitional arrangements. What kind of system would do that to people? Because every single person in life knows their circumstances do not change, stay the same and they change. Why would you build that into a system? Alison Johnson also said, and I have heard that the inclusion of self-employed people in the universal credit system was actually something that they just forgot about, but they decided, well, we're just putting them in with it, in the, it now that we've remembered about them. And I actually think that bears out, because if you look at it, anyone who's been self-employed will know that really 
it's not really viable to make an assessment about your daily needs on a month-to-month -month basis. That has to fundamentally change. Other members have talked about the gender issues. I, th I think it's the one that shocks me the most. That it is, it is well known that when you have pay payments to a single household, you know that that is likely going to be that those will go. Well, those benefits will go to the male earner in the household. There are literally thousands of women who are going to suffer if this is not fundamentally altered. The Director General of Universal Credit said in 2014, uh, that's Neil Cooling, said that many people are unaware that they will be changing from the HMRC to the DWP. And I'm talking here about working people, people who've worked for 20 or 30 years, but who have relied on a little bit of help through the tax credit system. Have you forgotten about those people? They will all be affected by this change. And frankly, it seems rather strange to me that you would take them out of the HMRC, move them into the DWP, and I bet any money that, it, as Neil Cooling says, it will be a shock when the letters arrive on the doorsteps of people who have never been unemployed, but all they've done is taking some credit uh, from the state. I, I, I mark my words. Why would you apply conditionality to those people who have paid their taxes as a working person? It seems to me quite extraordinary. What concerns me even more, we heard evidence from the PCS uh, last week, that managing universal credit and all the changes as far as the staff are concerned in the DWP is nothing compared so all of the work they will take from the HMRC, and remember all the people, thousands of people on tax credit, will now be uh, administered by the DWP and no account has been taken of this. Universal credit must be halted. If we have to tackle poverty in this country, then there's too many changes that need to happen before it actually works. I call Adam Tompkins for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Universal credit is the biggest and the most fundamental reform to the welfare state that we've seen since the welfare state's creation after the Second World War. It is a modern benefit based on two sound principles. First, that work should always pay. And second, that those who need support must, of course, receive it. This change is necessary, Deputy Presiding Officer, because we simply cannot go on with the legacy benefits that universal credit replaces. Those legacy benefits were a legacy of failure. The legacy benefits were complicated to use. They were completely outdated. They were, un they were unaffordable. But most importantly of all, Deputy Presiding Officer, they did not work for the people who use and rely on them. Af under, the last, under the last Labour government, not at the moment, under the last Labour government, the amount of spending on welfare increased by almost 65%, and at the same time, the number of households where no one had ever worked almost doubled. That is a legacy of failure. That's why universal credit is a necessary reform. That's why the Labour governments had the opportunity but didn't take them, had the opportunity but didn't take the opportunity to uh, reform welfare uh, under the Blair-Brown years. And that's why it was right, as Alec Cole Hamilton said, that the coalition government grasped that nettle and took responsibility and governed, which is not what we hear from the SNP front bench. So universal credit is uh, revolutionary. Um, the old system was one size. It's a significant change. It's a very significant change, for sure. No, there's no argument from these benches about the magnitude of the change that universal credit is seeking to achieve, uh, nor indeed the magnitude of the problem created under the last Labour government that needed to be addressed. And what we now have is not a system where one size fits all, but a system which is tailored to each claimant's individual needs, abilities and skills that recognises that every person is unique. I'll, I, I, will, I will in a minute if I can, Mr Brown. Even before the autumn budget uh, of last month, Universal Credit has been helping people get into work faster and stay in work longer than the old system. And alongside this, figures out only last week show that the number of children now living in a household without working adults is at its lowest ever. Having a working role model in a child's life is immeasurably important. And if that's one of the achievements of universal credit, then it's one of the achievements that I think we should welcome. Happy to give away to Mr. Brown. Keith Brown. 
Can I thank the member for giving away? He said that the uh, policy is tailored to individual needs, and yet the report from the Select Committee in the House of Commons says that it's the human costs of continuing to apply this appear simply too high, and it's arbitrarily punitive. Is there any criticism that you accept of this policy, or is it all just to be dismissed as rhetoric? Adam Tompkins. I, I don't dismiss all criticism of policy uh, as rhetoric, and I think I hope Mr. Brown knows me be better than that. Uh, in, I have been in and out of job centres all over the Glasgow region, which I seek to represent in this parliament. And what you hear when you go into job centres in Glasgow, and I'd, I'd be interested to know if it's the same as what Mr. Brown hears in the, in the job centres in his constituency, is work coaches whose work, I think, is you know, immeasurably to the uh, government's uh, credit uh, and to their own credit, uh, work coaches enjoying the flexibility, the new, unique flexibility that universal credit gives them that the legacy benefits uh, did not. Now, of course, there have been very significant issues with the rollout. As I said, this is the biggest single change to the welfare state that we've seen in 60 years. But I think that under successive secretaries of state, starting with Damien Green and then David Gork, and now Esther McVeigh, we see a DWP that is listening, that is learning, and that is seeking to make changes. Changes which we have called for and changes uh, which we welcome. We've seen the seven-day waiting period removed. We've seen interest-free advances added to the, to the system. We've seen free phone telephone numbers, which I remember Pauline McNeil calling for in a Social Security Committee when I served in that committee alongside her introduced. And of course, last week, uh, last month, excuse me, in the budget, we saw the Chancellor reintroduce £1.7 billion back into universal credit. Now, universal credit has always ensured that work pays, and now it pays even more. Something that stakeholders and charities right across the board, Deputy Presiding Officer, from the Resolution Foundation to the Trussell Trust to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and more have welcomed. The Trussell Trust, which the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in her remarks, said this, for example, by restoring the work allowances and increasing support to those moving on to universal credit, the government has listened to evidence from the front line and indeed from food banks. These are significant improvements, they said, that will make a real difference to many people supported by universal credit in the future. And the key point is this, that these changes, these changes will push the expected cost and indeed the expected generosity of universal credit higher than the system it replaces. Those aren't my words. Those aren't my words, Deputy Presiding Officer. Those are the words of the IFS, and they're supported by the Resolution Foundation, who said just this, just last week, that this will mean that the government's flagship welfare reform is now more generous than the benefit system that it is replacing. Not that we've heard any of that from any of the opposition benches in this parliament this afternoon. I'm happy to give away to the Cabinet Secretary. Shirley Ann Somerville. I'm grateful to, to the member for giving way. The Resolution Foundation also pointed out that the increase in work allowances, for whom it's coming back, because it's not coming back for everyone, and the decrease in income tax won't compensate the average household in the bottom 30% of income distribution for the amount they will lose due to the benefit freeze. So what you are bringing back, and it's not a lot, it doesn't cover what the UK government is already taking away from the poor. Adam Tompkins. But, but the, the point, Cabinet Secretary, the point is that under these reforms, as reformed, universal credit is now more generous than the system it is replacing. It isn't a scheme of cuts, it is a scheme of welfare reform. What we haven't heard in this debate, Deputy Presiding Officer, what we haven't heard is anything at all from the SNP front bench about what they want to do with their powers. We haven't heard anything about the devolution of employment services or discretionary housing payments, all of which have been fully devolved since 2017. We haven't heard anything about how they propose to use the power to top up reserve benefits. We haven't heard anything about how they propose to use the power to create new benefits. This today was an opportunity, Deputy Presiding Officer, for the SNP to lay out exactly how it sees devolved welfare powers working in Scotland. And we haven't heard anything from anybody on the front bench about that. The government, the Scottish government, still has no idea where hundreds of new Social Security staff are going to be working, despite having already advertised for some 400 workers. And they've been so slow. Minister, your government has been so slow to set out a timeline for delivering new benefits that the Office of Budget Responsibility has been unable to forecast how much it will cost. Um, excuse me, Mr. Tompkins. Could we have a wee bit of hush here and let Mr. Tompkins finish? He's nearly complete. My, my last point, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm grateful to you, is, is this. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation say, and they're absolutely right to say, that for those who can, work represents the best route out of poverty. That's why it is critical 
that universal credit is designed to get people off welfare dependency and into the world of work. And that's the argument that I that was uh, trying to have with uh, Alec Neal. His view is that universal credit isn't doing that. My view is that universal credit is doing exactly that. And it is for that reason, and actually, if I'm honest, for that reason alone that I support it. Because I believe passionately that the Joseph Roundtree Foundation are entirely correct. That for those who can, work represents the best route out of poverty. And that's why universal credit is working. It's working because under universal credit, people are more likely to be in work. It's working because under universal credit, claimants work more than they did under the legacy benefits. And finally, presiding officer, it's working because under universal credit, claimants are earning more uh, in wages for the work that they're doing. That's why I support universal credit. That's why I support the amendment in Michelle Ballantyne's name. I call Aileen Campbell to conclude this debate for up to nine minutes, please. Thank, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the debate today was passionate and informed, informed by many of the organisations and third sector groups that contacted MSPs who described the impact of welfare reforms on universal credit on people and communities. And not just anyone, but cuts that seem to particularly target the most vulnerable in our society. And as Alison Johnson's pointed out, a pernicious impact on women. And this debate also coincides with a visit to Scotland by the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. A timely visit and a timely debate as this afternoon gave us all the chance to talk about the impact on people of these cuts, highlight the hurt, highlight the punishment being endured by families for daring to have more than two children, and recognise that despite the rhetoric from the Chancellor or the claims that austerity is over, that more and more children are being pushed into poverty. Because, presiding officer, universal credit, the UK's flagship welfare policy, is in crisis. Successive UK governments have failed to develop and resource universal credit properly over the last eight years and failed to learn crucial lessons about its disastrous impacts on households across the UK. And as the UK budget made clear, they've failed even now to take the action needed to sort out this mess, which is why it must be halted until it's made fit for purpose. No government should be pursuing policies that are so clearly causing harm, yet the ideological cuts seems, still seem to be too irresistible for a UK government hell-bent on ignoring facts, figures, the devastation and hurt the welfare cuts are causing. And because the truth is that people are hurting, and we've heard from the Trussell Trust about a 15% increase in Scottish food bank use, directly relating that to shortfalls in universal credit. We've heard from George Adam talk about a constituent of his being sanctioned in hospital recovering from a heart attack. Mark Griffin described how family circumstances can suddenly change and yet the welfare system is now no longer designed to help provide that safety net that so many families up and down this country require. Maureen Watt also spoke about her constituents caught by the two child cap after fostering a member of their family after family bereavement and then going on to have two children of their own. Absolutely horrifying examples about what is happening in the here and now as a result of Conservative action. Presiding officer, the Conservatives, I think, eh, Michelle Ballantyne called these people customers. Presiding officer, therein lies the problem. The inhuman transactional opinion the Conservatives and the UK government have about our welfare state. And maybe that somehow helps them cope with the pain that has been felt by others. To keep it hum inhuman, to keep it separate somehow, there seems to be certainly no care and there certainly seems to be no understanding. And to suggest, as I think Annie Wells did, that somehow we in Scotland should just ignore the root cause of the poverty caused by the social security cuts from her government, and to not bother that the finger of blame points squarely at the UK government and the disruption they are creating, that to right this wrong, the Scottish government should just absorb it, to continue to soften the Tory blows and to take money from elsewhere from within our budget to plug the gap. Presiding officer, that situation and that opinion is simply unsustainable. Because the fact is, it is estimated that annual social security spending in Scotland will be £3.7 billion lower in 2020 21 than it would have been without UK welfare reform. Now, to put that into context, this is the equivalent to three times our annual police budget or the entire annual budget of both NHS Glasgow and Lothian together. 
Presiding officer, that is one heck of a sticking plaster that Annie Wells and Brian Whittle expects this government to find. Presiding officer, let me be clear that while the chaos of welfare cuts is the fault of the Conservatives, we will not, though, sit blithely by. That is why we have, with the powers and the resources that we have, taken significant action. We have spent £125 million on welfare mitigation and measures this year to help protect those on low incomes. That's over £20 million more than we spent last year. And that includes fully mitigating the bedroom tax, helping people keep their homes. It also includes our Scottish Welfare Fund, which has helped 306,000 individual households, a third of them with children, with awards totalling £173 million over the past five years. This is money that simply lets us stand still, mitigating the worst impacts of another government's policies by another set of politicians blind to their impact. And on universal credit specifically, we have given people in Scotland the choice to receive their universal credit award either monthly or twice monthly and to have the housing costs in their UC award paid direct to their landlords. And we're committed to delivering split payments in Scotland too. Free school meals are available to all children in primaries one through to three and for children of families on low income. But we know that many families struggle with the cost of feeding their children when this provision isn't available during school holidays. And that is why the programme for government announced an increase to our fair food fund to £3.5 million. And £2 million of this will provide targeted support to children and families experiencing food insecurity during the school holidays. And last week I launched the financial health check with Citizen Advice Bureau Scotland to help reduce household costs. Please offer that is just a flavour of the action we are taking to help protect the people of Scotland. And furthermore, in response to claims that we have not used the powers at our disposal, let me set that record straight. And guided by an approach to ensure that that safe and secure transition and already delivering a better service in Scotland with a service designed with people, we have, since the 2016 Scotland Act passed, started extensive consultation. 2017 started delivering Scottish universal choices to give people flexibility over UC payments. In 2018, the Social Security Act was passed. The agency was established. It has started delivering carers allowance supplement and it will deliver Best Start grant before Christmas, despite the DWP not having changed its IT system to aid us in that delivery. Exactly. And we have announced that the disability benefits assessment will be fairer. That suggests to me that there is a lot of action happening as a result of this government's priority and commitment to helping those that are most vulnerable in our society. And the UK government and the Tories talk about testing and learning. Well, they should learn from this government in, running of, in the running of a social security service that is based on dignity yeah. and respect. <laughs> But of course, there is more that we have to do. We need to make good on our targets on child poverty. And we're working on the development of a new income supplement to lift children out of poverty. Presiding officer, though, tonight we will again come to vote to send a message to the UK government. And I have no doubt that all bar the Conservatives will unite to say to that UK government <laughs> to scrap your two-child limit policy and its morally bankrupt rate clause. Halt the chaotic rollout of universal credit and please treat people as people, not as customers and certainly not as some sort of target for your ideological drive to stigmatise those in poverty. Presiding officer, it doesn't have to be like this. We as a country have the potential to take a different path. We are showing a glimpse of what is possible through our new social security agency. Another Scotland is possible, one that is based on fairness, equality and protecting those that are most vulnerable. Unfortunately, that is not a message that we see being taken forward by the UK government. They need to heed the will of this parliament, they need to listen to what we are telling them and to stop with their callous cuts to their social security system and pe treat people with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Thank you very much and uh, that concludes our debate on the impact of UK government welfare cuts and universal credit on poverty. We're now going to move on to the next item of business which is an urgent question which I was able to select earlier and I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for returning from Dundee uh, to be able to answer this question or the questions that members will wish to put this afternoon. Uh, as a consequence of the urgent question decision time will be at uh, 5.15 today. Uh, urgent